You are watching DHTV from California State University to Vegas Hills. Hello, my name is Mike Fraga and I'm a guide to a course that seeks to understand some of the issues that concern the contemporary United States immigrant population in general and the Mexican and Central American immigrant populations in, in specific. The historical experiences of the diverse immigrant population that created and continue to create the economic and social foundation of the United States is surveyed in this class, along with the legal steps an immigrant must follow in order to achieve citizenship. And all of this is done in an effort to bring awareness to the contemporary human crisis. So this course explores the immigration policy and U.S. immigration policy and its effects on the different immigrant communities in the United States. So the purpose of this course is to learn about the dilemma of U.S. immigration, its history, policy, and current crisis. Now we need to remember that the world's nations have their populations existing as American citizens in the United States today. Their respective histories intermingle in the streets of all the major cities of the United States. In this course, we are beginning to explore the different racial and continental expressions that are emanating from the immigrant experience. And uh, <clears throat> all of these peoples uh, are, are here, uh, especially here in Los Angeles. We have Europeans, Africans, Asians, Pacific Islanders, Middle Easterners, uh, Latin Americans, and native peoples from throughout the Western Hemisphere. So we're all part of a place that the Spanish eventually are going to call Los Angeles or Los Angeles. So <clears throat> for those of you who are out there in cable land, uh, there is an 800 number that's available for you. And by all means, please call in if you have any questions or comments about the topics that will be covered today. And students, please take advantage of this online uh, address and come and chat with me as we explore the concepts for the course. Also call in, let me hear your voices. Let me hear what it is that you're thinking um, and what, you, uh, what kind of ideas you have with regards to the topic at hand. So last week we came to appreciate the red beans <clears throat> and we arrived at an understanding that native peoples were removed to accommodate immigrants arriving to this country. Now we are going to concentrate on the white beans and we're going to appreciate their struggle to become part of the system. But before we do that, let's go and find out what's happening today with regards to the immigrant experience, especially what happened this last week. Back in the United States, the U.S. Supreme Court has temporarily lifted restrictions on President Trump's travel ban, meaning about 24,000 refugees may now be barred from entering the United States. Last week, an appeals court in Seattle ruled tens of thousands of refugees who had received promises of assistance from refugee resettlement organizations should be allowed to enter. But on Monday, the Supreme Court intervened to block this ruling. The Supreme Court is soon expected to issue a fuller ruling on the ban, which blocks refugees and all citizens of six majority Muslim nations from entering the United States. In New Hampshire, authorities are investigating an apparent attempted lynching in the town of Claremont. A mother says her eight-year-old biracial child had to be airlifted to the hospital after a group of white teenagers reportedly hung him from a tree. She also posted photographs on Facebook showing the injuries to the child's neck. The child's grandmother also says the white teenagers were taunting the child with racial slurs before the attack. The town of Claremont is 96% white. The Trump administration's considering whether to further reduce the number of refugees allowed into the United States to fewer than 50,000. That's according to the New York Times, which reports the plan has the support of Homeland Security officials and senior White House advisor Stephen Miller. President Trump has already capped the number of refugees resettled annually in the U.S. at 50,000, less than half the 110,000 refugees admitted under President Barack Obama. 
On Capitol Hill, Vermont Independent Senator Bernie Sanders is set to introduce a universal health care bill today that would expand Medicare coverage to include every American. Under emerging details of the plan, everyone 55 and older and children under 18 would qualify for Medicare during the program's first year, while the remainder of adults would be phased in over four years. The program would pay for doctors' visits, hospital stays, preventative and mental health care, and prescription drugs, while expanding Medicare to include vision, hearing, and dental care. To pay for the expansion, the bill would levy a new 2.2% income tax on all Americans and a 6.2% tax on employers who would no longer be required to provide health insurance to workers. The measure would also raise taxes on the wealthiest Americans. Ahead of today's rollout of the bill, 15 senators comprising a third of the Democratic caucus signed on as co-sponsors. They include New Jersey Senator Cory Booker, Massachusetts Senator Elizabeth the White House called Wednesday for an African-American host of ESPN's Sports Center to be fired after she called President Trump a white supremacist on Twitter. On Monday, Sports Center anchor Jamil Hill tweeted, Donald Trump is a white supremacist who has largely surrounded himself with other white supremacists. The comments drew a public reprimand from ESPN and outrage from conservatives. It also drew the support of anti-racist activists, including NFL quarterback Colin Kaepernick. On Wednesday, White House Press Secretary Sarah Huckabee Sanders called on ESPN to fire Jamil Hill. I think that's one of the more outrageous comments that anyone could make, uh, and certainly something that I think is a fireable offense by ESPN. Jamil Hill later deleted her tweets critical of President Trump. She issued an apology late Wednesday saying they painted ESPN in an unfair light. Congress has sent President Trump a resolution condemning violence at a march of white supremacists and neo-Nazis in Charlottesville, Virginia last month. The measure came after Trump claimed both sides were to blame and said there were very fine people among far-right protesters. The White House says Trump will sign the resolution, which passed unanimously. The resolution came as President Trump met at the White House with South Carolina Senator Tim Scott, the only black Republican currently serving in the Senate, who's criticized the president over his comments on Charlottesville. Following a closed-door meeting with the president, Senator Scott indicated President Trump had not expressed regret over his comments. The White House circulated a photo of Trump's meeting with the senator, mislabeling his name as Tom Scott instead of Tim Scott. In Boston, fans at a Red Sox game unfurled a giant banner Thursday over the famed Green Monster outfield wall reading, Racism is American as Baseball, where it remained for a few minutes before Fenway Park security guards removed it. In a statement to the Washington Post, the fans behind the banner drop described themselves as a group of white anti-racist protesters. President Trump sent mixed messages Thursday over whether he's reached a deal with Democratic leaders on legislation that would provide a path to citizenship for undocumented immigrants who were brought to the U.S. as children. On Wednesday, House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi and Senate Democratic Leader Chuck Schumer said they'd agreed to a deal with the president that would protect some 800,000 dreamers after Trump ordered the cancellation of the DACA immigration program. But on Thursday, Trump cast doubt over the agreement, first tweeting no deal was made last night on DACA before later telling reporters he was largely in agreement with Pelosi and Schumer. Well, we want to get massive border security, and I think that both Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer, I think they agree with it, but so we met last night with, as you know, Schumer, Pelosi, and a whole group, and I think we're fairly close, but we have to get massive border security. Oh, I think he's on board. Yeah, Mitch is on board. Paul Ryan's on board. But House Speaker Paul Ryan said Thursday there was no deal struck with Trump and accused Democrats of negotiating through the media. Meanwhile, Breitbart News, the far right-wing website, uh, had a headline encouraging people to burn MAGA hats. That's Make America Great Again hats. In Arizona, the Phoenix New Times reports employees of the Motel 6 chain share the names of hotel guests with U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, leading to the arrests of at least 20 people. The New Times reports at least a third of the arrests came after ICE agents knocked on motel room doors without a search warrant and asked for permission to enter. A Motel 6 spokesperson said the program was implemented at the local level without the knowledge of senior management and promised the company would order managers at more than 1,400 locations not to share guest lists with immigration authorities. The widow of an Indian man who was murdered by a racist gunman at a Kansas bar last February has been denied a visa. 
Sunayana Dumala's husband was working in the U.S. under the H-1B visa program. And after his murder, Dumala's residency was terminated. Dumala is enlisting the help of Congressman Kevin Yoder, who says immigration law should be changed to protect the spouses of hate crime victims. In New York City, plain clothes ICE agents arrested four undocumented immigrants at a Brooklyn criminal court building Thursday morning in an unusual move targeting a courthouse for immigration enforcement. An ICE spokesperson later confirmed the arrest, saying the four men were suspected of gang activity. ICE policy prevents officers from making arrests at sensitive locations like schools, hospitals, and places of worship without approval from supervisors. Courthouses are not included on the list, but the practice is unusual and has been criticized by prosecutors, police, and defense attorneys. This is Catherine Poor of the Legal Aid Society. It makes people very scared uh, when they hear things like this happening because they are told by the court that they have to return for their court dates. That's something that they are ordered to do, and if they don't do it, they can a warrant can be issued for their arrest. On the other hand, if people hear that there's ICE coming into the courthouse, if there's ICE coming outside of the courthouse, and they have fear for their own immigration situation, that puts people in a very, very difficult position. New York is a sanctuary city. President Trump Thursday repeated his claim that both sides were to blame for violence at the rally of white supremacists in Charlottesville, Virginia last month. The attacks injured dozens and left 32-year-old Heather Heyer dead after the 20-year-old Nazi sympathizer James Fields barreled his car into a crowd of anti-fascist protesters. Trump's comments in the wake of the attacks, including a claim there were very fine people among the far-right protesters, drew outrage even from members of the Republican Party. On Thursday, Trump doubled down on his remarks as he spoke to reporters about Wednesday's meeting with the Senate's lone black Republican, South Carolina's Tim Scott, or as the White House mislabeled him in a photo of their meeting, Tom Scott. Trump was speaking to reporters aboard Air Force One. Great talk yesterday. Uh, I think especially in light of the advent of Antifa, if you look at what's going on there, you know, you, you have some pretty bad dudes on the other side also, and essentially that's what I said. Uh, now, because of what's happened since then with Antifa, you look at, you know, really what's happened since Charlottesville. A lot of people are saying, in fact, a lot of people have actually written, gee, Trump might have a point. Okay, so let's understand and appreciate uh, what's going on today. We are eventually going to get there. But we need to recognize that Trump's election represents the Republicans' commitment to white racial power. It started with Nixon's Southern strategy. It gained fruition with Reaganomics and Papa Bush's a Thousand Points of Light. And this notion of commitment to white racial power was permanently ensconced it's, and it permanently ensconced itself in the guise of son of a Bush's terrorism doctrine. So this commitment to white racial power is what got Trump elected. And when looking at the recent demonstrations of this white superiority fantasy, the people participating are not the common, poor, white trash stereotypes of thugs with tattoos, though they are posing as militant buffoons, but middle-class professionals working in offices and in higher education, and living as your next-door neighbors. And when Barack Obama was elected, the reactionaries began recruiting heavily under the Tea Party label. And now, under Trump, they have blatantly come out coveting white power and white privilege. The religious right, meanwhile, underscores white supremacy. Evangelicals and fundamentalists give praise to God for bringing Trump to power. So <clears throat> we're going to learn in this class that there is a long history of racism and anti-Semitism in the United States that's guised under immigration policy. And today, when we take a look at the alt-right, it is very well armed, and they all have automatic rifles. And that is what the Republicans let loose from their closet when they gave Trump the executive suite. And it will be interesting to see how the Republican Party tries to control this idiot that they granted power to. But meanwhile, what we're going to be doing today is trying to appreciate the white beans. And these white beans are very important for us because these white beans uh, are key to helping us appreciate why we came to this situation in, the, in its, itself. 
And we have to remember that uh, we need to appreciate how everybody becomes part of the system. Now, one of the reasons why people are in constant motion is that they are searching for opportunities to continue their economic existence. People are constantly searching for economic survival. And so most often, people want to make sure that they can achieve a subsistence level that guarantees that their families will be fed, clothed, and sheltered. And in this way, we can appreciate that throughout human history, people have migrated throughout the world in search of a decent human existence. Likewise, it is important to understand that wherever there are economic uh, systems, wherever economic systems are established, labor forces are required to create the infrastructure that facilitates the exchange of goods and services. Consequently, history reveals that systems are constantly looking to form as well as control labor forces so as to create markets as well as build the monumental architecture designed to enhance the exchange of goods and services. So throughout history, we witness the formation and control of labor forces, and this is done in order to facilitate the enhancement of economic growth and development. So let's put down in the bottom thirds of formation and control of labor forces, because whether it is done through voluntary labor agreements or enslaved labor or contractual forms of labor, Systems desire people's skills. Systems desire people's knowledge, experiences, or assets. And it is this way that systems recruit workers. Workers migrate to areas where their labor is valued, where their labor is required, where their labor is appreciated, where their labor is wanted. So we want to understand that throughout the historical development of the United States, there is a constant need to form and control labor forces. Please understand that. We have a system. It needs workers. So it recruits workers in whichever way it can recruit the workers. We must keep that in mind. The need to form and control labor forces is tied to federal policy. The need to control labor forces and form them and control them is tied to international relations. So businesses in the United States rely upon the federal government to find them workers. Please understand this. As we have taken a look in previous presentations, since the colonial era, governments have been involved in securing voluntary immigrants to the country and most importantly, involuntary immigrants to the country in whichever way possible. It is part of international policy. So the United States federal government has been actively recruiting labor forces for this country since its inception. Treaties <clears throat> and negotiations are entered into to bring labor forces <clears throat> into the United States for its economic development and growth. So let's review how the white beans, <clears throat> remember these white beans, let's review how the white beans began. Let's review the importance of indentured servitude, the indentured servant. In the second session of this course, we learned that labor recruitment is the key to the migration of European populations since the colonial period. Now, the major distinction amongst European immigrants to the British colonies before the American Revolution related to the way in which they were able to afford passage to the colonies. Some were able to immigrate based on their own or family resources. Generally, if you, if you had skills or if you had capital or if you worked in a specific pro profession, you were coming across. And so those who could pay their way, government officials, clergy, merchants, artisans, farmers, uh, gentry, and lesser nobility, they came in and they were able to establish themselves, no problem, because they had the money, because they had the means. But the majority did not. The massive immigrants are going to come as indentured servants. The indentured were required to perform an average of eight years of labor to repay the price of their passage. Because of a lack of capital and skills, they were forced to perform arduous labor. And many times, because of a lack of opportunity, their indentured status was extended. So their only opportunity for success was the British elimination policy of native peoples from their land. 
But the British can eliminate the native peoples from the land, then they could then have access to land, because that's the key. You don't want to be an indentured servant, you want to be a landowner. Or if you didn't like the oppressive conditions from your master, then you could run away. And usually if you ran away, you went and joined native people's resistance movements. Now most often indentured rebellions in the southern colonies are going to pave the way for their replacement as workers through the introduction of slavery. White masters do not like it when white workers rebel. So wherever slavery appeared in the British colonial experience, it was usually preceded by white indentured servitude, a servitude that many times led to white rebellion. So let's visit a film clip that I already shared with you in the second part, on uh, the second session of this class, but let's appreciate the importance of indentured servitude to the creation of the United States. Let's go to that film clip. This is the story of the Mayflower, actually, of the uh, Pilgrim voyage uh, on uh, three days before they, or two or three days before they, they landed. The, the, the majority of the people there, over 50%, were indentured servants. And uh, they staged a revolt on board. And uh, what came out of it is the famous document known as the Mayflower Compact, where uh, all the people there were uh, declared themselves uh, equal free and equal. They, um, uh, uh, they revolted against the, um, uh, against the form of servitude that most of them had been committed, had signed up to, uh, um, uh, to put themselves under. And, uh, you know, through a uh, revolt of revolutionary servants, the first uh, New England colony, uh, Plymouth, became a, a democracy of, of sorts. It was a limited democracy, but uh, it was the most uh, democratic society uh, at that time uh, in, uh, in colonial America. Uh, well, in the colonies, the, the, most of the colonies, or all of the British colonies, were really set up by corporations. And as soon as uh, possible, uh, people who were uh, hooked into it, who were often indentured servants, <clears throat> where they, they signed up for passage for a certain number of years, they would have to work to work off the... Uh, the money that the passage cost, and uh, then they were able to get off on their own. And uh, they, as soon as they uh, got out, many of them just ran away and from a uh, from that form of bondage, and uh, you know went off into the wilderness. So, but as soon as they got uh, into their own communities, into uh, um, small towns, small villages. They were basically uh, cooperative communities there. They, the cooperation was, uh, uh, and democratic procedures were basically the, uh, the way they, uh, they uh, settled uh, the country in the, in the early years. Okay, <clears throat> we also learned in the second session of this course that while a steady flow of immigrants characterized the early 19th century, a torrent of people are going to arrive between 1840 to 1860. And historians identify this as the first great wave. Now the surge in population came from the new national origins of the majority of immigrants. Before this era, most immigrants uh, and, and those who had been part of the American experience had been Protestants. Now the majority in the first great wave are Irish immigrants of the Roman Catholic faith and German immigrants of the Jewish background. So cultural conflict and economic competition ensued. And as is frequently the case with immigrants, the Germans, Irish, and others who arrived uh, in the 1840s and 1850s are going to concentrate in northeastern cities instead of spreading themselves evenly across the country. The Germans and the Irish concentrated in three major cities, New York, Philadelphia, and Boston. So the growth of the cities and the increasing volume of immigrants created a new dynamic in the history of immigration. Cities came to overlap with immigrant ethnic populations. And as unregulated industrialization proceeded apace, the quote-unquote problems of the cities were often veiled in ethnic references to immigration and their descendants. And because of their language, because of their religion, immigrants in the first great wave began to challenge the dominant culture of the United States, at least as it was concentrated in the cities. 
For the most part, the immigrants coming in were unskilled, and they were coming from rural communities. The needs of the U.S. economy required their labor. The needs of the U.S. economy required their willingness to work. So the level to which they succeeded economically varied with the cycles of boom and bust in capitalism. And up until the 1840s, the states and territories that the U.S. acquired sought populations. So the majority of the United States born, uh, uh, the majority of those United States that was born in the U.S., that population lived in rural areas. But it was immigrants who stayed in the cities. So when they came in, they did not challenge the economic well-being of the majority of the U.S. born. But what happened was those who were living in cities became, became to feel their presence. And so in the 1850s, anti-immigrant mobilization appeared in the guise of a political party. And it gave us a concept that is still operative today, and that is nativism. So students, please understand this concept. It comes from the white beans. The nativist experience. The first nativist movement in the United States became known as the American or the Know Nothing Party. Its agenda was a concern about immigrants, particularly about the cultural and political differences that the Know Nothings perceived coming from immigrants. One of their demands was for an extension of the period prior to naturalization from five years to 21 years. And the party reached its peak in the 1856 election but it never strongly influenced national immigration policy. Its decline came at the onset of the Civil War because the Civil War reshaped U.S. politics and the party system. Concern over immigration policy in the 1850s was lost in the bigger controversy that we will explore next week over what to do with the involuntary immigrant, basically the black beans, the slave. So the concern over the white beans kind of dissipated over the concern of the black beans. Now we're going to go to a scene from the gangs of New York and we will witness Daniel Day-Lewis as he portrays the best impersonation of an American nativist, racist, Protestant, and anti-Catholic coming out of the Hollyweird movie industry. Now, get to understand this because when whites, when they, when they get into roles, boy, they can really be a good nativist and racist. So let's take a look at this particular clip. At the building of our country right there, Mr. Cutting. Americans are born in. I don't see no Americans. I see trespassers. Irish hops. Do a job for a nickel what a nigger does for a dime and a white man used to get a quarter for. What have they done? Name one thing they've contributed. Votes. Votes, you say. They vote how the Archbishop tells them. And who tells the Archbishop? They're king in the pointy hat what sits on his throne in Rome. Bill's got mixed feelings as regards the Irish. Bill, deliver these good and fervent folk to the polls on a regular basis, and there'll be a handsome price for each vote goes Tammany's way. My father gave his life making this country what it is. Murdered by the British with all of his men on the 25th of July, Anno Domini 1814. You think I'm gonna help you befoul his legacy? Like giving this country over to them was had no hand in the fighting for it. Why, because they come off a boat crawling with lice and begging you for soup? You're a great one for the fighting, Bill, I know. But you can't fight forever. I can go down doing it. And you will. What did you say? I said you're turning your back on the future. Not our future. document makes you a citizen. This one makes you a private in the Union Army. Okay, so let's understand certain experiences with regards to the immigrant, especially at that time, known as nativism, the Know Nothing Party, again. But what's important to appreciate, and this is, this is a very hidden part of the history of immigrants, is their contributions uh, to society. Now, an important group of immigrants during the first great wave, it helps us recognize that injustice, the injustice that can be perpetrated by a powerful nation over a weaker one, uh, there's this group that Mexicans are going to call the San Patricios, the St. Patrick's Battalion. 
Now, when we take a look at the St. Patrick's Battalion, it provides us an example of immigrants who are going to witness injustice and they're going to take a stand against immorality. Now, you can imagine an important population, an immigrant population, coming to the shores of this nation. And they want society to accept them on equal terms. So they decide to join the military. Many times they didn't have a choice. And often they hope to prove to America their desire to become part of an egalitarian experiment. So their journey leads them to Texas, to South Texas. And in South Texas, they experience a nightmare of prejudice, discrimination, segregation, and involvement in actions by soldiers deemed as genocidal. The dismemberment of innocent elders, women, and children. Now the racist expressions of the U.S. military in South Texas in 1846 is going to prompt an American soldier of Irish descent to defect and to join the opposing forces. Now, John Riley convinces numerous immigrants, the majority Irish and German, to take a stand against injustice. Before war is declared against Mexico, a battalion of Irish immigrants in the U.S. military decide to defect and fight for Mexico. And when the United States declares war, Captain John Riley will already have a regiment in the Mexican army known as Los San Patricios. They will form a battalion and meet their familiar enemy on the front lines of battles in the Mexican war known as Tamaulipas, Coahuila, and Monterrey. Now the St. Patrick's Battalion will bravely fight for what they consider to be the side of justice, morality, and honor. And throughout the U.S. war with Mexico, the battalion will be reinforced by deserting immigrant soldiers of the American army. And they would rather run away from death, they face death by switching sides, because they chose to fight in the front lines against an enemy they judged morally in the wrong. So we're going to take a look at a film clip that records the legend of Los San Patricios. We're going to listen to a song honoring the St. Patrick's Battalion. So let's witness a film clip from a movie honoring their heroic decision. In the movie is known as One Man's um, Hero. Now Tom Berenger plays Captain John Riley. So when the Irish are captured at the Battle of Churubusco, due to the fact that General Santa Ana retreated his forces, leaving the immigrants vulnerable, as prisoners of war, those who defected to, prior to the declaration of war are spared death. Those who defected prior to the declaration of war are to be branded on their cheek the letter D for deserter. Those who defected during the war are condemned to be ceremoniously hung. General Wilmfield Scott arrogantly proclaims that the hanging of the St. Patrick's Battalion is to occur once the American flag displaces the Mexican flag flown over the castle of Chapultepec. So Los San Patricios patiently waited with a noose around their neck for the cry wailing from the Nino Ero as death. The children's last stand against injustice, if anybody knows anything about the Mexican War. The Mexican flag being replaced by the American flag signaled their death. So let's watch today's modern rendition of the San Patricio's experience. In this film clip, we will see Tom Berenger take on the role of John Riley, uh, captain of the St. Patrick's Battalion. The scenes are taken from the film One Man's Hero. Please listen to the words of the song composed especially for this, for this clip. David Rovich provides on, honorific tribute to the man who died for Mexico. And let's go to One Man's Hero. My name is John Riley. I'll have your ear only a while. I left my dear home in Ireland. It was death, starvation, or exile. When I got to America, it was my duty to go. Enter the army and slog across Texas to join in the war against Mexico. And it was there in the pueblos and hillsides saw the mistake I had made. Part of a conquering army with the morals of a bayonet blade. And there amidst all these poor dying Catholics, screaming children, the burning stench of it all. Myself and 200 Irishmen decided to rise to the call. From Dublin City to San Diego, we witnessed freedom tonight. 
So we formed the St. Patrick Battalion and we fought on the Mexican side. We formed the St. Patrick Battalion and we fought on the Mexican side. We marched neat the green flag of St. Patrick emblazoned with Erin Gobra. Right with the harp and the shamrock and Libertad Pala Republica. Just fifty years after Wolf Tone, five thousand miles away, the Yanks called us a legion of strangers, and they can talk as they may, but from Dublin City to San Diego, we witnessed freedom denied. So we formed the St. Patrick Battalion, and we fought on the Mexican side. We formed fought on the Mexican side. We fought them in Matamoros while their volunteers were reaping the nuns. In Monterey and Cerro Gordo, we fought on as Ireland's sons. We were the red-headed fighters for freedom amidst these brown-skinned women and men. Side by side we fought against tyranny. Fascinating. Okay, so when John Riley was in prison, he penned a letter to a friend in Michigan explaining to him why he made the decision to fight against the United States. And in it, in it he hinted that the war was immoral, and that the war reflected the experience of the Irish with the British in their defense of the homeland against Protestant indifference. In all my letter, I forgot to tell you under what banner we fought so bravely. It was a glorious emblem of native rights that being the banner which should have floated over our native soil many years ago. It was St. Patrick, the harp of Aaron, the shamrock upon the green field. So Los San Patricios are an example, or an exemplary illustration that immigrants coming to America do have a conscience. An important group of immigrants during the first great wave that helps us recognize the injustice that can be perpetrated by a powerful nation over a weaker one are the San Patricios. 
The St. Patrick's Battalion provides us an example of immigrants who witnessed injustice and took a stand against immorality. Okay, now the Civil War. The Civil War devastated the South and it left the country in shambles. As we will learn next week when dealing with slavery or the involuntary immigrant experience in the United States, the Civil War and reconstruction of the nation's first civil rights movements brought about uh, um, three important amendments to the Constitution, 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to the Constitution. Yet America was not ready to put the black beans on an equal footing with the white beans. The involuntary immigrant on an equal footing with the voluntary immigrant. So we come to a compromise. And this compromise is known as the Compromise of 1877. And it brought Rutherford B. Hayes to the presidency and it ensured that the South would continue apartheid policies until the civil rights movements of the 50s and 60s brought racial codes to a standstill. Now, with the Republican Party and the ascendance of Trump, we have the deliberate, uh, uh, the, the deliberate dismantling of the civil rights movement. Yet, as historian Alan Nevins writes, the year 1877 was, quote unquote, one of the blackest in the nation's annals. And why? Because in 1877, the economy was in its deathbed and democracy was not existent. Unemployment, bankruptcy, business failures, severe depression. What that does is encourage violence, and it encouraged violence. It created poverty, and it wrought despair. And so when we take a look at the presidential election of 1876, it was tainted by fraudulent vote counts, and it was thoroughly corrupted. Journalist Louis Laphan summarizes the year 1877 very well. A number of Republican politicians have been murdered in the southern states for their disagreement with the policy of lynching Negroes. Lincoln County War in New Mexico encouraged the random shooting of Mexicans. Mobs formed in the streets of San Francisco to beat to death the Yellow Peril as personified in Chinese laundrymen and shopkeepers. A railroad strike in West Virginia that began in July became the first national strike in the country's history. 500,000 workers walking away from factories and mines everywhere between New Jersey and California. Strikers in Pittsburgh set fire to the property of the Pennsylvania Railroad. They destroyed 39 buildings, 104 engines, 46 passenger cars, and more than 1,200 freight cars. The disturbance moved Tom Scott, president of the railroad, to suggest that the strikers be given, quote unquote, a rifle diet for a few days and see how they like that kind of bread. State militia and federal troops complied with the suggestion, killing more than 100 strikers in Maryland and Pennsylvania. So clearly democracy was not the dream of perfection that was anticipated by immigrants coming to the shores of this nation to build this nation. And the violence and the hypocrisy of the era encouraged Mark Twain and Charles Dudley Warner to label the era known as the Gilded Age. The name refers to the process of gilding an object with a superficial layer of gold and is meant to make fun of ostentatious display while playing on the term Golden Age. It was known as the Gilded Age. Let's take a look at a film clip uh, accompanied by the music of Jay Lee. She sings a song dedicated to the railroad workers who struggled to survive in 1877. And let's go to that clip. Along the Chesapeake's great shore, the poor were living rotten as can be. Sewage ran into the streets, some could not afford to eat, and poverty was quickly expanding. Wages fell 25% with 3 million in unemployment, the bulk of the burden on the poor. No B&O was profit bound, the bosses cut the wages down, the workers wouldn't take it anymore. The year 18 77, the day July 11th, B and O bosses came and said, Your workers better listen up, another 10% was cut, you've got until the 16th to accept. Was lunchtime when the strike began, the brakeman and the fireman said, I'm not gonna work for this low wage. 
They stopped their train at Camden Junction, wouldn't let the railroad function, and struck with a dream of better days. The strike that spread to Martinsburg were shut down of the rails occurred, and workers were lined up along the track. Said, we're not working for the boss no more, we're working for ourselves, the poor, and we are going to take our wages back. The governor sent in troops to stop it, protecting the railroad profit, but they were outnumbered by the crowd. So President Hayes sent troops to fight, shot a man and broke the strike, and strike breakers rolled those engines out. Cumberland on the western end of Maryland, Governor Carroll sent the National Guard. They were set to board their train at the Camden Station on the 20th of July they would depart. That Baltimore evening, Big Sam told the streets were filled with people who knew the workers needed their support. The 5th and 6th Regiment were ordered by the government to get to Camden Station and report. The 6th Regiment came out, met my rocks from all around. They charged with their guns all lowered down. They fired on the angry mob, pushed them through and marched along with ten lying dead upon the ground. The 5th Regiment advanced with speed, but right across Madison Street on Utah Street there stood a great surprise. Armed with sticks and rocks and more, the people of Baltimore were waiting for them under darkened. They clashed and soldiers charged ahead, rushing with their bayonets, injuring any in their way. And blood and smoke were in the air, resistance was everywhere, and Baltimore was rising from its chains. And women threw rocks and bricks from windows of apartments, and fought with strength that many would admire. Indeed, it was a bloody night, the people held the bloody strike, the soldiers pushed and stabbed and fired. When they finally got to Camden Street, half the guard had mutinied and 15,000 people had turned out. They yelled and fought and cheered and clapped, railroad cars and tore up track and shut Camden Station down. Now stuck inside the station house was Governor Carroll himself with Mayor Latrobe and a bunch of cops. They told President Hayes the news he summoned up more federal troops to bring the insurrection to a stop. The crowd dispersed and soldiers came, but still they couldn't run the trains, though the crowd was no longer there. The strike had spread up west and north, from Baltimore to Pittsburgh. Rebellion was erupting everywhere. strike was over, crushed by gangs of federal soldiers, with 100 people gone and dead. A government sworn to uphold change, could have made a living wage, but gave the crowd the bullets instead. Governor Carroll served the boss, Baltimore taxes paid the cost, and the railroad barons thanked the president. And Baltimore life went back to normal, poverty, fear, and fruitless toil, destined to rise up once again. Now let it Ever known. No worker ever stood alone. There's hope inside the power of a union. So take a stand and join the fight. The same one fought that glorious night, July 20th, 1877. All right, fascinating, huh? Um, it is in this era of deceit, deception, and disillusionment that the second great wave begins to arrive. And as we pre learned previously, the second great wave of immigrants to this country uh, occurred between 1880 and 1920. Now, why is it important for us to appreciate this and why is immigration so important in the United States? Because it is a conscious policy created at the federal level that's designed to bring labor forces into the United States for industrialization. Businesses need workers, hence immigration policies. 
So in the Gilded Age, between 1875 and 1900, approximately 14 million people are going to enter the United States. And during the Progressive Era, from 1900 to 1917, approximately 18 million people will arrive between the years uh, as mentioned. Now the difference in both of these eras is that many are coming from Eastern and Southern Europe as compared to the immigrants of the colonial era and the early 19th century, which witnessed immigrants arriving from uh, Northern and Western Europe. So we have a different variety of white beans. And the people who arrived from 1875 to 1920 are distinctively different from those who arrived previously. And the people are usually coming from subsistence economies or non-industrialized societies. So the white beans take on a different flavor here. They are now Eastern and Southern Europe rather than Northern and Western Europe. And they are not Protestant. They are Catholic, Jew, and Jewish. And so <clears throat> their, um, Western industrialization for these immigrants uh, is very important. Now, why did they come? Well, they sought to escape political and religious persecution. Jews were restricted in their civil rights in Russia. Slavic people experienced similar tragedies in the Balkans. Now, most Eastern and Southern European countries were barely entering the industrialization process where commercial agriculture ousted the subsistence producer from their lands and forced them to move to urban centers that were not quite ready to take off into industrial capital thereby creating overpopulation in, Eastern, in European cities. So labor recruiters in Europe painted a picture of the United States as this ideal place to survive. And compared to Europe, wages were higher in the U.S. And most importantly, public education, which is a necessity to train workers in the language of the market so that they could follow instructions, was available on a large scale. So how did they get here? Well, the majority came to New York, Boston, and, they came, and, and Hoboken, New Jersey, and they came through a place called Ellis Island. And the steamship cost $30, and it usually took two weeks to get here. Let's listen to Gene Hackman narrate a documentary on the white bean experience in America. Over 12 million men, women, and children passed this way. Passed through rooms and corridors haunted with a special stillness which remains only in places once noisy with human life. Here they bought tickets for a thousand places in America. Here they traded their drachmas, their liras, and their ruples for dollars. Here they sang their first American songs, experienced their first American Christmas and Hanukkah. Here they waited to be given permission to pass over to the new land. Tens of millions of us have relatives who came this way. Sat in this room, part of the largest human migration in history. Of the many who came, some were turned away. But even they would leave part of themselves in America to remind us why they had come so far. why they had made the journey. Okay, students, I provide for you uh, the documentary on, on Blackboard for those of you who are interested in looking at it. But as they entered, as you will learn if you watch the documentary, uh, they had to take a very demeaning uh, uh, physical exam for glaucoma and tuberculosis. They had to take a paper exam, and this was so as to weed out any radical uh, uh, people who thought that they had rights, uh, anarchists, socialists, and most importantly, for women, prostitutes, because America just can't handle that. 
Uh, now, depending on city budgets, uh, several aid societies assisted them in, social, in, the, in socializing to the industrialization process. But let's go back to the clip and let's find out what happened as they're passing uh, border uh, inspection. It doesn't just take for everybody to go through it. The ice. Trachoma, the dreaded disease of the immigrant, the diagnosis for which could lead to almost certain deportation. If there's anything that put a chalk mark here, chalk mark there. Those identified to be set aside for possible rejection represented a small percentage examined each day. But this was little consolation to a family separated. You didn't have to know the people, but you know that somebody's missing. The agony they went through. So you know that somebody's missing in the family. All of a sudden the thought, my goodness, they're separating us because that's what the police uh, always did. They separated the men from the women and then took care of the women and children. As long as some member of the family, some loving member of the family was with you, life was tolerable. Uh, you lived in a relationship of family love. Even though the other members of the family, you didn't know where they were, you could converse, you could plan, you could warm each other. I had a feeling that I'm left all alone. It's a terrible feeling. All of a sudden they were gone. America did not want the burden of an unhealthy immigrant. America wanted a person who could make a living and was not bringing into the country an infectious disease. And they looked your back over and with your lungs and your heart and, your and you were sent from one to the other, one doctor to the other. And a lot of people was put away on the side. I wouldn't want to be in so bad. People were rejected because they showed outward signs of illness, what they considered mental difficulties. We didn't call it psychiatry, they called it neurology. And we said, we're sorry. And the ship that brought them had to take them back. That was a, a tragedy. I decided if, I, if they ever, ever have to send me back, I'll jump down to the water. and never go back to Russia. I never want to see it again. Built for 1,500, the dining room often fed 3,000. There would be dishes and forks and knives and white napkin, long tables, well set. But when the people went in, it was like, like chaos. And they handed us food. Uh, food was uh, not something people gave you. I didn't like it, but then I tasted it again. But I never had seen a banana before. To me, this white bread was like cake already. <laughs> At night, Ella served as a dormitory for thousands, waiting the new day. Each morning, the great hall would fill, and the noise would begin again. Hopefully, their papers were in order, a clean bill of health, a letter from a relative guaranteeing they would not become a public charge, proof that they were not a contract laborer. 
for a dangerous alien. Commits. In adjacent rooms, the detained were given additional scrutiny and an opportunity to make their case. But accepting an appeal to Washington, the Board of Inquiry was the rejected immigrant's last chance. Through an interpreter, they did their best to persuade him to overcome the complexities of a changing immigration law. But it was in the Great Hall where the vast majority faced their first and their last test. In his hand, the man at the registry desk held the ship's manifest. In his power, the right to interpret questions intended to identify those who should be let in or kept out. They know a word of English. I couldn't understand English, not one word. First question, how much money have you got? She had to have five pounds. My father, I remember, gave me that five pounds. Do you know how long? It took a couple of years, two and three years, to get that $25. My mother, when we got near it, and the person at the desk called our names, my mother turned to me, she says, I was never here, how does she know my name? I said, so right, mother, she knows it. They asked for my name, and I told them Licht, and they say, how do you spell it? And I didn't know how to spell it, and they didn't know it, and they spelled it L-I-C-H-T. I said, it's all right for me, I don't know the difference. But then they said, all right, you can go. You're free to go. To Hoboken. Yeah. Okay, so that's the immigrant experience. Um, what did they do? Well, they were the labor forces for the modern factories in steel, coal, meatpacking, railroads, and the military. Remember, the military needs soldiers to remove native peoples from the land so as to make room for the immigrants. So immigrant soldiers formed the majority of the regiment that participated in the Wounded Knee Massacre, as we shared with you last week. They were unskilled and they were paid miserable wages. Promotion and acquisition of skills was not available to them. There was tension with those immigrants who were already here. There was an association between their occupations and their ethnicities. Jews were concentrated in the garment industry. Slavic peoples worked in the coal mines and the Italians worked in various factories in the transportation industry. So the industrial and the political elites of the United States are going to take hold of this country and they're going to organize the greatest march of economic growth in human history. And they're going to do it with the aid of and at the expense of every conceivable labor force that the United States could recruit. Um, this march of economic growth transformed existing social relations. It introduced radical changes in production and occupational structures. So you can imagine as the work pace mechanizes, workers are going to lose control over the work process. Now industry can add unskilled human labor, whereas previously skilled labor made the whole process. Now individuals take on one part of the process. This is why women and children become expendable in this era. So mechanization also means that the worker is no longer an owner of their own tools and or machines to create the product. It used to mean that workers owned their own tools and they made a finished product. But now the worker is easily replaceable. And this made it very difficult for the workers to combine their energies so as to protect their interests. There were always other workers to replace them. So the loss of skills also meant the loss of organizing ability. And so, this became the, so that workers became differentiated between their skills. There were those who had tools. They were the skilled workers. There were those without tools who were working the machines. Those were the unskilled workers. Now, mechanization also means that, you're, that your workplace is regulated by time. So hours of the working day became a measure of labor, and hours regulation becomes a goal of reformers. Now, let's talk about one basic aspect of life, and that is uncertainty. 
Uncertainty is that basic aspect of life and it is socially distributed. It can be aggravated or it can be mitigated depending on class or socioeconomic background, but also on the region you live in, your age, your gender, and most importantly, your race. Now, this kind of uncertainty involves whether one is going to be working or unemployed. And there is a serious difference. The owner of tools has more control over work and income than one who has only labor to produce a product. So workers reduce their uncertainty by organizing into unions. Okay? And that's why they all talked about all as one or none. Now, workers during the Gilded Age and at the turn of the century, uh, they fought for an eight-hour day. Can you imagine an eight-hour day? Workers created fraternal associations. Workers got involved in city politics. So there were very, two very important unions during the Gilded Age that impacted the immigrants' lives. And first was the Knights of Labor. And the Knights of Labor demanded an eight-hour day and, produced, uh, and, and promoted the producer's ethic of republicanism. Uh, the Knights of Labor was primarily, uh, their demand was for the eight-hour day, and they also called for <clears throat> legislation to end child and convict labor. They were uh, supporters of cooperatives. So if you could put on the bottom third, uh, the Knights of Labor versus the American Federation of Labor. The Knights of Labor, again, was their primary demand was for an eight-hour day. They were eager supporters of cooperatives. The second union was the American Federation of Labor. The American Federation of Labor, we know it today as the AFL, was one of the first federations of labor in the United States. It was founded in 1886 by an alliance of craft unions disaffected from the Knights of Labor, a national labor association. So most, when we take a look at this early period, especially with regards to immigrants and the immigrant tradition, most, a, a lot of violence accompanied the growth of industrialization. So strikes became common. And people usually stuck for what is known as bread and butter issues. And bread and butter issues are basically, well, you need adequate pay, you need decent working conditions, decent working hours, better working conditions, an eight-hour day. Can you imagine? Uh, as Malcolm X would say, they were tired of working from can't see in the morning to can't see at night. So strikes were the only effective tactic to get owners to listen to them. Now, strikes are important because they stop the production process, and this impacts the owner's profits. By 1881, the federal government began keeping statistics on strike activity. And in the 1880s, there were around 500 strikes per year involving over 150,000 workers. By the 1890s, there were anywhere from 1 to 2,000 strikes per year involving 750,000 workers. Now, strikes are not necessarily violent, but strikes do measure a level of conflict between capital and labor. And in fact, historians see this period as open class warfare workers versus owners, especially due to the hiring of armies to quell working class agitation. So you're going to be reading an article on very, some very important strikes or a chapter by uh, Harvey Wasserman uh, students uh, on some very important strikes that reveal the violent struggle between capital and labor during this era. But we're going to visit a documentary uh, that's required for this particular class on Emma Goldman um, and we're going to take a look and appreciate the homestead strike as an example of this intense labor conflict. Let's go to that. June 1892. A strike at the Andrew Carnegie owned steel plant in Homestead, Pennsylvania escalated into one of the bloodiest labor battles the country had seen. The Homestead strike came during a period of intense unrest. Thousands of men and women fought for the right to strike, to form unions, and to establish a 40-hour work week. They were met with force from police, from soldiers, and from the hired armed guards of the Pinkerton Detective Agency. On June 25th, workers called the strike. Henry Clay Frick, plant manager, closed the mill and locked them out. Then he called in the Pinkertons. Two weeks later, in the middle of the night, 300 Pinkertons crammed onto barges and were towed 10 miles up the Monongahela River 
to Homestead. Armed workers were waiting on the river. At dawn, a pitched battle broke out. Twelve hours later, three Pinkertons and seven Strikers lay dead. To us, it sounded like the awakening of the American worker. The long-awaited day of resurrection. In Alexander Berkman, it stirred something deeper. It was the moment for what anarchists called propaganda by the deed, a political assassination. His target, Henry Clay Frick. Emma and Sasha and their friends live in virtual reality. There's therefore a sort of an element of folly. Now that we've covered the first and second generation immigrant worker experience, let's appreciate what happened to the second and third generation immigrant farmer. Let's go to the farm now. We've understood the white beans with regards to workers and immigrants, but let's go see what happened to those who were able to get a farm. Because machines in this era changed farming. Farming became a capital investment, which required skill, capital, loans, and credit. A farmer's income became erratic. Farming became mechanized. So you can imagine steel plows, mowing machines, reapers, harvesters, improved cotton gins. All of this encouraged the farmers to go into debt so as to participate in this expanding market. Land costs money. Money's, machines cost money. So farmers had to borrow, hoping that the prices of their harvest would stay high so that they could then turn around and pay the bank for the loan, the railroad for the transportation, the grain merchant for handling, and then the elevator for storing their products. But farmers found the prices for their produce going down and the prices of their transportation and loans going up. And meanwhile, monopolist bankers and monopolist railroads could charge what they liked. Farmers who could not pay their debts lost their homes and land and they became tenants. And by 1880, 25% of all farms were rented by tenants, and the number kept rising. Today, not even 5% of farms in the U.S. are owned by individuals. Many farmers didn't even have enough money to rent, so they became Mexicans. Oh, I mean, uh, they became farm workers. By 1900, there's going to be 4.5 million farm workers in this country. And it was the fate that awaited every farmer who could not pay his debts. Now, the government played its part in helping the bankers and hurting the farmers. It kept the amount of money based on the gold supply steady while the population soared. So there was less and less money in circulation. So the farmer had to pay off debts in dollars that were harder to get. So the bankers getting the loans back were getting dollars worth more than when they loaned them out. It was a kind of interest on top of interest. That is why so much talk of farmers' movements in those days that had to do with putting more money in circulation, by printing greenbacks, paper money in which there was no gold in the treasury, or by making silver the basis for issuing money. So the first Farmers' Alliance began, movement began in Texas. And why? But basically, and especially in the South, the crop lien system was most brutal. And the system goes like this. The farmer would get the things needed from the merchant, the use of the cotton gin in harvest time, whatever supplies were necessary. And since the farmer did not have any money to pay, the merchant would get a lien, a mortgage on the farmer's crop. And of course, on which the farmer might pay 25% interest. So historians write for this, that the system became, for millions of Southerners, both white and black, little more than a modified form of slavery. The farmer would owe more money every year until finally the farm was taken away and the family became tenants. And as the male died, the family and the children inherited the debt. So the Granger movement and the Farmers Alliance spread new ideas and a new spirit in the 1880s and 1890s. And eventually this movement for change will create one of the most challenging crusades against the Democrats and the Republicans that this nation has ever witnessed. It was known as the People's Party or the Populist Party. And what's so important about the People's Party or the Populist Party is that it was, it convened in 1890 in Topeka, Kansas. 
And the People's Party or the Populist Party had attempted by, uh, to, to try to organize uh, and challenge the Democrats and the Republicans. It was the most challenging crusade ever because they viewed the Democratic Party and the Republican Party as being in cahoots with big business. And it was uh, the farmers were just getting the short end of the stick. So I'm going to read a statement from one of the most fiery speakers. And her name was Mary Elizabeth Lees. And they called her Mary Yellen Lees, as she became fondly known. And it reveals the extent of their frustration with the Democrats and Republicans. So if you can keep her picture up for a while here, what I want to do is I want to share her words. And uh, hopefully I can do justice uh, to her words. And she said, she made in a speech she, she, the following. Wall Street owns the country. It is no longer a government of the people, by the people, and for the people, but a government of Wall Street, by Wall Street, and for Wall Street. Our laws are the output of a system which clothes rascals in robes and honesty in rags. The politicians said we suffered from overproduction. Overproduction when 10,000 little children starve to death every year in the United States and over 100,000 shop girls in New York are forced to sell their virtue for bread. There are 30 men in the United States whose aggregate wealth is over one and one half billion dollars. There are half a million looking for work. We want money land and transportation. We want the abolition of the national banks and we want the power to make loans direct from the government. We want the accursed foreclosure system wiped out and we will stand by our homes and stay by our firesides by force if necessary and we will not pay our debts to the loan shark companies until the government pays its debts to us. The people are at bay. Let the bloodhounds of money who have dogged us thus far beware. So when we take a look at the populist the populace consisted of Southerners, uh, 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 tenants, small landowners, and then, of course, because it was in the South, uh, it, it, there was segregated units, so they had a separate organization for blacks. But it also consisted of Midwest farmers and, most importantly, elements within the labor, union, la labor movement. And this was the first important movement to insist that laissez-faire economics was not the solution to industrial problems and that the federal government had responsibility for the nation's social well-being. So this generation of immigrants along with farmers and along with workers are going to organize together because the populists tried to unite farmers who were divided on racial barriers and create alliances with labor unions who also uh, were part of the immigrant experience. And the first test of solidarity was the Depression of 1894 and the election of 1896. And the Depression of 1894 laid off workers, cut wages, closed factories, created a rise in unemployment ranks, and cut the operations of railroads, and it pinched farmers. So you have a lot of people who are starving to death, and there is this big old chasm between the rich and the poor. And this depression engendered violence and encouraged many Democrats to start listening to the populists. It's sort of like, for instance, uh, Bernie Sanders today. Uh, encouraged many Democrats to listen to Bernie Sanders. Meanwhile, Republicans called all those populists and all those Democrats supporting them as communists, as anarchists, as socialists, as nothing but unpatriotic American agitators who should immediately be deported. But that's the classic Republican response to any kind of crisis. And the election of 1896 saw William Jennings Bryan representing the rural population and the plight of the urban worker pitted against William McKinley, a banking, shipping, coal, iron, and railway businessman representing the millionaire boss. And this was the election of 1896. Let's go to a film clip from a famous movie and appreciate the significance of the populist moment. It's all right. You may all come out and thank her. Come out, come out, wherever you are, and meet the young lady who fell from a star. She fell from the sky, she fell very far, and the Kansas, she says, is the name of the star. Kansas, she says, is the name of the star. She brings you good news or haven't you heard when she fell out of Kansas, a miracle occurred. It really was no miracle what happened was
was just this: The wind began to switch, the house to pitch, And suddenly the hinges started to unhitch. Just then the witch, to satisfy an itch, Went flying on her broomstick, thumbing for a hitch. And oh, what happened then was rich. The house began to pitch, and pitch into a ditch. important this particular movie even though Hollywood uh, made it in the 1940s and kind of distorted the whole uh, meaning and message of The Wizard of Oz. But The Land of Oz was created by American author L. Frank Baum and illustrator William Wallace Denslow. And economic and historian, uh, history professors have published scholarly studies that indicate that the images and characters that were used by uh, Baum and Denslow resembled the political images that were well known in the 1890s. There was the Scarecrow, Tin Man, and Lion. Like other elements, elements and characters and elements in The Wizard of Oz, they were common themes found in editorial cartoons of the 1890s. And Baum and Denslow, like most writers, used the material at hand that they knew best. And they built a story around them and they added Dorothy and then they added a series of lessons to the effect that everyone possesses the resources that they need, such as brains, a heart, and courage, if only they had self-confidence. Although it was a children's book, of course, Baum noted in the preface that it was a modernized fairy tale as well. So let's go back to this fairy tale and let's appreciate something about the Wicked Witch. <laughs>
Okay. Now, those who interpret the wonderful Wizard of Oz as a political allegory of the populist movement, they see Dorothy as that woman coming of age in America, hoping to represent all of the little people, the munchkins, who have no voice. Now, originally, the slippers were silver, not ruby. And the silver represented the quest of the populace to make silver the basis for issuing money. And the Wicked Witch of the East, the, the one who died as Andy Elm's uh, uh, Andy M's house landed on her, represented the banking industry. So the people are liberated from the banks who have taken all their money. Now the Wicked Witch of the West represented the railroads. The Scarecrow, the central figure, was a reflection of the popular image of that second and third generation immigrant American farmer. Although he has been persuaded that he is only a dumb hick, he possesses a strong common sense a remarkable quick-wittedness that needs only to be reinforced by self-confidence and the willingness to organize politically. The Tin Man. That Tin Man is the industrial worker. The industrial worker needs a heart to join the scarecrow in demanding change. The Cowardly Lion is the politician who might be willing to speak up on behalf of the downtrodden if he has the courage to do so. And the Yellow Brick Road represented the economy that was based on the gold standard and the wizard himself is the leader of this great benevolent government who is able to manipulate every situation. So as the film clip shared with us, the banks were finally put out of commission, no longer threatening the people. And it sounds like a message for us today, given that the banks have taken the money and run. Now, this protest against privilege and monopoly was ultimately expressed in the assassination of the president at the turn of the century. So yes, students, you need to understand that the president at the turn of the century, 1900, was assassinated. That is a significant historical event. An anarcho-syndicalist hearing the voice of an immigrant Russian woman named Emma Goldman, she was uh, uh, talking about justice and liberty against capitalist monopoly. Well, he listened to her and he decided to take fate in his own hands and he symbolically eliminated the symbol of injustice. And the populist movement became a moment and it transformed into what is known as progressive reform. So revolution engulfed the world. And so let's watch a film clip from a documentary that is required viewing for this class. And let's appreciate the importance of Emma Goldman and the significance of the assassination of President William McKinley. Not like the brazen giant of Greek fame, with conquering limbs astride from land to land. Here at our sea-washed sunset gates shall stand a mighty woman with a torch, whose flame is the imprisoned lightning and her name, Mother of Exiles. From her beacon hand glows worldwide welcome. Her mild eyes command the air-bridged harbor that Twin Cities frame. Keep, ancient lands, your storied pomp, cries she with silent lips. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest-tossed, to me. I lift my light beside the golden door. Emma Lazarus. Okay, unfortunately, I made a mistake here, uh, and uh, there was supposed to be a clip that comes from Emma Goldman's uh, that shares something about the significance of the assassination of the president. Uh, and we went into a clip that was very, very important uh, that we need to appreciate. Because there is a rich heritage in America from the immigrant experience. It is all for one or none. And this experience is known as socialist organizing. When we talk about patriotism, and let's understand and appreciate patriotism in this country, most often, the right wing of America claims that they express the American spirit and they revere its symbols, while those who criticize the U.S. government are quote-unquote anti-patriotic. 
So students, I want you to know that the terms progressive and patriotic are part of the immigrant experience because all immigrants that come into this country want to contribute to this country because that's why they're here. They're contributing. So let's take the Pledge of Allegiance. It was written by an eight, in 1892 by a leading Christian socialist. His name is Francis Bellamy. And he was fired from his Boston ministry for his sermons depicting Jesus as a socialist. So let's put down uh, socialism, uh, Francis Bellamy, at the bottom thirds. Now Francis Bellamy is important for us to appreciate because we need to recognize uh, his sermons that Christianity is socialism. Now, this is very important because Christianity is a challenge to treat all as human when redistributing the collection of wealth. That's the key message. That's the key message that he was espousing. The Trinity represents the unified presence of humanity. Uh, when, when we talk about the Sermon on the Mount, most Republicans think it's the Sermon on the Amount. But the sacrament, the body of Christ, all churches are built around the physical presence of Christ's socialist commitment. And this is what drove Francis Bellamy to write in the Pledge of Allegiance a more collective and egalitarian vision of America. One nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So get to know that when you pledge allegiance to the flag. The whole idea and the whole experience is about socialism. All for one or none. Okay, So let's take, um, the, uh, let's take the Statue of, of Liberty. Uh, in, this, in this particular case, we just saw uh, the film clip on the Colossus, the new Colossus. This was a poem that was written by Emma Lazarus. So we can put socialism, Emma Lazarus, and let's just show her picture. And she was a poet of considerable repute in her day. She was a well-known figure in literary circles, and she took interest in, the social, uh, in socialism and the socialist tradition. And she wrote this Welcome to the Wretched of the Earth in 1883 as an effort to project an inclusive and egalitarian definition of the American dream. Okay, so we can come back now and let's take a look at another socialist, Catherine Lee Bates. She was a prof professor of English at Wellesley College. Uh, she was an ardent feminist. She was a lesbian socialist. And she wrote a very important song called America the Beautiful. And in this song that so many patriots sing, it reflects this lesbian's view that US imperialism undermines the nation's core values of freedom and liberty. The song or the poem's final words, and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea, they are an appeal for social justice rather than the pursuit of wealth. So next time you hear a right-wing evangelist uh, uh, singing America the Beautiful, whisper in their ear that they're singing a, 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 song, a, a poem that was written by a radical lesbian feminist. So please get to know this. Okay? So, again, um, um, uh, what is socialism? Well, let's listen to uh, Ray Charles, the America the Beautiful, just so, so we can get an idea of the importance of this message. Oh, beautiful For heroes proved In liberating strife Okay, so this message is very important, and we only have so much time, and I got to cover some material. So let me just share with you why socialism is so important, why the immigrant organizing into unions is so important for us to appreciate today. Now, first of all, with regards to socialism, socialists take the position that all persons share certain needs. There exists some minimum requirement of food, shelter, health, and so forth, which all people share. And no decent society would concentrate wealth in the hands of the few while the needs of the majority go unmet. So society has to be organized in such a way that can allow and encourage all human beings to realize their humanity. So let's talk about progressive reform in the socialist tradition. Uh, let's put that in the bottom four. Human beings from the socialist view are purposeful beings 
who are able, if given a chance, to make decisions intelligently, who have intentions and purposes, and who can become aware of alternatives and rationally choose among them. People are potentially self-directed and self-determining. People are capable of self-expression and creativity. But you have to be given the chance. And equality of condition is the foundation of socialism. And this is what the second great wave of immigrants brought to this country, the dream of equality. Now get to know it. They believed in civil rights uh, uh, for all Europeans. I say Europeans because many of them had their reservations with Native Americans, about Native Americans, and many were hesitant about the blackness of America. And of course, there's problems with Asians and Mexicans. But nonetheless, this is the great heritage, equality of condition for all. Now, an event worth appreciating concerning the immigrant women's experience and what led to reform that led to immigrant rights and women's rights and children's rights is a very important uh, event known as the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire that occurred in 1911. Industrial growth affected factory workers most directly. Working conditions were often dangerous. And family survival required women and children to work, often in the lowest paid, most exploited positions. Uh, women and children worked in poor ventilation, dangerous fumes, open machinery, no safety precautions, and in unhealthful conditions. Let's appreciate what happened to primarily Jewish immigrant women in New York in 1911. It was late in the afternoon on a beautiful spring Saturday, March 25th, 1911. 4.40 p.m. to be exact, nearly quitting time at the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory in New York's Greenwich Village, where 500 workers, mostly young Italian and Jewish women and girls, got ready to collect their pay and go home. Someone dropped a match or a cigarette, and within minutes, the factory, which occupied the top three floors of a 10-story building, became an inferno. Fire ladders, which reached only six floors, were useless. The fire escape collapsed under the weight of desperate workers trying to escape. One of the doors, it would be reported, was locked. Onlookers out for a weekend stroll in nearby Washington Square Park watched in horror as women leapt to their deaths from upper story windows, some crashing through the firemen's nets, others hitting the sidewalk with a sickening thud. It's almost a mirror of what happened in 9-11. In some ways, it was the horror of the fire jumping the way they did. Now, it was more intimate, though. You could look into their faces in their last moments, hear them hit the pavement that way, you know. In the days that followed, family members crowded into a makeshift morgue, trying, sometimes in vain, to identify those they lost among the charred remains. On that day, says researcher Michael Hirsch, all of New York was united in grief. This fire really shook people up. You know, the city was so guilt-stricken that maybe we were somehow responsible. And it, it led to all of these reforms that came afterward. Okay, for want of time, we don't have enough to share this, the uh, rest of the clip, but what's important to understand is uh, uh, progressive reform in the socialist tradition. And one of the things that was so important here was to challenge the Democratic and the Republican Party to do something with regards to immigrant rights, to women's rights, to children's rights. And of course, it had to, uh, had to end in tragedy uh, to finally get politicians to listen. And that's why the importance of uh, progressive reform and uh, again, uh, 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 the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire, immigrants having to die, in this particular case, women uh, are dying uh, as a result of unfair uh, labor practices. Now, World War I is a turning point with regards to progressive reform because the United States now is, not going, is going to go to war and it will not entertain dissent. And so the United States is going to pass uh, one of the most important acts uh, that's still in the books today, and that is the 1917 Espionage Act. And the Espionage Act forbade the use of uh, disloyal, profane, scurrilous, or abusive language uh, about the United States government, its flag, or its armed forces or speeches that caused others to view the American government or institutions with contempt. 
Now this act was very important because the majority of people uh, were not signing up to go and fight in the war. And so the act allowed the postmaster general to refuse to deliver mail that met the same standards for punitive speech or opinion. And so the act was to be applied only in times when the United States is in war because you're either with us or you're against the enemy. Or you're either with us or you're with the enemy. So the Espionage Act made it a crime to uh, aid enemies of the United States uh, or to interfere with the war effort or with military recruitment. And so one, one, another act that was very important was the uh, Sedition Act, of um, the Alien and Sedition Act of 1918. Um, the act extended the provisions of the Espionage Act uh, uh, to cover a broad range of offenses, notably speech and the expression of opinion that cast the government or the war effort in a negative light or interfered with the sale of bonds. Um, one historian of American Civil Liberties has called this act the nation's most extreme anti-speech legislation. And the, those convicted under the act generally received sentences of imprisonment for 10 to 20 years. The Espionage Act was used to imprison Americans who spoke or wrote against World War I, uh, and that act is still with us to this day. And then in 1918, uh, the uh, Alien and Sedition Act, again, uh, this Alien and Sedition Act is important because there's two precedents for Americans to use the term alien when referring uh, to immigrants. This term alien is associated with sedition. That's the key. Alien is always associated with sedition. Hence, hence, to use the term alien indicates the person is identified people who are not loyal to the United States. And that is where the nativist character comes in because they want to use the term alien to describe somebody who automatically is not uh, 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 for this country. So again, please understand that alien at the very beginning was used in reference to Europeans. Eventually now, uh, I remember to the white beans, this aliens were the white beans first. Uh, then eventually it's going to be applied to the black beans and the brown beans. Um, Europeans acquired this description. Why? Because in 1917 and 1918, they were organizing into unions and they were trying to survive for their, for their own benefit. They were very radical in the sense that they did not want to overthrow existing authority, but they wanted to at least have the authority make sure that they were treated decently as human existence, as human beings. So for us today, uh, this loyalty became emphasized after 9-11, and the Patriot Act dramatically reduced restrictions on law enforcement agencies' ability to search telephone, email, communications, medical, financial, and other records of private citizens. But basically what happened at, the, at World War I, the immigrants' search for an economic existence in this country led to significant uh, legislative acts. And uh, this legisl these legislative acts implemented by Congress help us to understand the process that immigrants have had to go through to become a part of this community known as the United States of America. Because in almost all of these acts after World War I, um, passage was based on the fear of the other, the fear of the not me, the fear of the stranger at the gate. And let's recognize the fear factor when discussing issues that are related to the immigrant experience. And that immigrant restriction legislation uh, is very important because it starts with the Palmer Raids. And the Palmer Raids were attempts by the United States Department of Justice to arrest and deport radical immigrants in the United States. So they're going to go after the radical whites. They're going to go after the radical white beans. And the arrests and raids occurred in November of 1919 and January of 1920 under the leadership of a reactionary attorney general, just like the one that we have today in terms of Jeff Sessions, uh, Attorney General A. Mitchell Palmer. Now more than 500 foreign citizens are going to be deported including a number of prominent leftist leaders such as Alexander Berkman and Emma Goldman that you will be seeing in the documentary. Palmer's efforts were largely frustrated by officials at the U.S. Department of Labor who had responsibility for deportations and who objected to the Attorney General's disrespect for the legal process. The Palmer raids occurred, and this is similar to what's happening today with regards to Sessions and DACA. Uh, Palmer raids occurred in the larger context of what is known as the Red Scare in the United States 
This was a term given to the fear and reaction against political radicals in the United States immediately following World War I when the Russians had their revolution. So let's take a look at a film clip that helps us understand the raids and to help us understand the Alien and Sedition Acts. In the aftermath of the First World War, as the country began to think about what was meant by a, quote, return to normalcy, unquote, part of the agenda was to craft uh, a more comprehensive social control form of immigration and deportation laws. And the laws that were developed in 1917 had both ideological components and uh, criminal enforcement components. And in many ways, that was the first comprehensive sort of modern type of deportation law that, that we saw. And it arose out of a lot of loyalty uh, controversies that had taken place during the war. And it also confirmed the role of the federal government and the bureaucratized model of deportation enforcement. Um, so it started focusing on criminal aliens as well as focusing on people who were ideologically deemed to be subject to deportation, anarchists and socialists in particular. Those things sort of developed parallel uh, together during that period. And I think the underlying idea was that there are certain people who are just not worthy of being members of American society, and even if they have been admitted legally, we should get rid of them. A lot of the discourse as it develops in the 1920s around these sorts of laws focuses on an alleged crime problem that was largely undertaken by non-citizens. When you actually read more sober studies of the period, you uh, might really question whether there was such a crime wave. And uh, also, you would notice that there were a lot of native-born American citizens who were engaged in criminal activities as well. But the public discourse began to shift, particularly with the rise of J. Edgar Hoover and the early FBI, the focus turned increasingly to deporting non-citizen criminal aliens, particularly those convicted of crimes involving moral turpitude, which was a category that was developed in those early laws, and also people with uh, drug offenses. Um, and so the, the mechanisms of deportation, the, uh, the systems uh, became increased, the funding became increased, the bureaucracy became much larger, and we started seeing more people being focused on. Uh, this continued uh, into the 30s and the 1940s, and in many ways has continued to the present Okay, so that particular film clip, and of course, with regards to, again, the, the Espionage Act, the Alien and Sedition Act, the immigration restriction legislation, this is so important uh, because the 1920s, well, we, we are reliving the 1920s. It was one of the most racist decades ever, yet everybody was consuming and it was an urban society and all that jazz. But the 1920s is important for us because the 1920s is going to introduce uh, some uh, very r restrictive legislation, and it was based on nativism. But this time, uh, the nativism is uh, uh, the, the 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 nativism, the beliefs that people have about non-white racial groups as well as Southern and Eastern Europeans. These beliefs become rigid in the 1920s, and they served as justification for certain actions. Now, the belief that one group is superior to another results in certain actions. And it is important to understand the underlying ideology on which an everyday level justifies these actions. That's why it's important for us to appreciate what's going on under the Trump administration, because we find the basis for these ideologies expressed by the media, by individuals, and in literature. And the 1920s uh, gives us uh, 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 the laboratory by which to assess what's going on today. Now... Ideology is a set of interrelated beliefs, values, attitudes, and norms that are used to explain and justify existing social relations. Basically, ideologies form a matrix by which uh, people can explain behavior. How's that for matrix? Uh, how about that for Kinu ribs? Because racism as an ideology isn't new, but group, because groups have always felt superior to other groups. But modern racism is different because it's the only form of racism with scientific vindication. And there have always been philosophies behind racism, but scientific racism has the guise of science. And so scientific racism was known as eugenics. And eugenics arose in the late 19th and early 20th centuries at a time when people of color were increasingly being exploited. And so when we take a look at uh, these 
of eugenics, eugenics and the science of racism justified existing stereotypes and gave sustenance to broader policy choices. So how did eugenics, uh, why is eugenics so important? Because they influenced two of the most important immigration pieces of legislation, and that uh, the National Origins Act of 1921 and 1924. Now the reason why these most controversial acts, and this is very important, uh, concerning immigration passed both houses of Congress was related to these radical white immigrants, the radical white beans. Uh, they, the government did not like them. They were usually Italian, uh, they were German, uh, uh, they were Jewish uh, socialists, um, they were anarchists. Uh, they did not like the idea of immigrants organizing for their rights into unions. And so in the 1920s, it was anti-union, anti-Italian, anti-Jewish. Of course, with regards to the blacks and, and people of color, there's still that. But remember, alien refers to Europeans at this time. And so the National Origins Act of 1921 and 1924 were passed in Congress Congress was frightened by what was known as the Red Scare. There was a Russian revolution in World War I, during World War I. Now the radicalism practiced by white immigrant workers who wanted justice scared the business community. So when the 1920s began, um, those of you who know U.S. history, any union that, was, that espoused uh, radical tendencies, especially the industrial workers of the world, the IWW or the Wobblies, was destroyed, as you're going to be reading in the chapter uh, that's assigned for this particular beans. All radical immigrants are going to be deported, and the main leader of the Socialist Party, Eugene Debs, is going to be in jail. Strike by work, strikes by workers are going to be beaten down by force. And so Congress in the 20s is going to put an end to the dangerous and turbulent flood of immigrants by passing laws setting immigration quotas. The quotas favored Anglo-Saxons, it kept out Africans and Asians, it limited the arrival of Italians, of Slavic people, of, and most importantly Russian Jews, uh, English, Protestant, and Irish are going to be favored over African, Chinese, and Eastern Europeans. So, the National Origins Act solidified what is known as the melting pot theory for white Americans. It ensured that there's a three-generational process of assimilation. Immigration in the 1920s became a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant privilege. And at the same time in the 1920s, the KKK is going to be revived and it spread into the North. So that by 1924, the KKK is going to boast 4.5 million members. So the warning sign to immigrants coming to America became centered in the decade known as the Roaring Twenties, the Jazz Age. Only wasps apply. Now what we have learned is that when you are in a disadvantaged position, you must organize for your rights. White beans have a history of protecting themselves from harm. And that history is all of us or none. That's very important to understand because these immigrants that came into the United States at that time are going to be attacked. They want their rights. They want to be represented. And so uh, if we could go back and end this with Ray Charles's uh, America the Beautiful, just let me know if you guys can cue it up. And let's just end the class with Ray Charles, uh, America the Beautiful, and then just close it out. Um, well, again, we need to recognize and appreciate um, the America the Beautiful that was written by Catherine Lee Bates. Uh, this was a woman who had gone into uh, uh, the, she went to visit the Shoshone lands uh, in, in uh, known, today known as um, Yellowstone National Park. She saw the beauty of it and she decided to write a song about, uh, again, that American imperialism should not uh, destroy this land, that the Americans need to respect the environment. Let's go to America the Beautiful. Liberating strife Who more than self Their country loved And mercy more than life
something like this. Yeah. 